Praise the Lord. This is New Life Experience located at 5708 Howard Falls Drive in the beautiful city of Savannah, Georgia. We would like to take this time to welcome you to our service on today, our Sunday school class, and also to welcome you on our service today, which begins at 1230 p.m. and you have enough time to make it. So without further ado, on behalf of our pastor, District Elder John Philip Anderson, and our First Lady Sister Sally Anderson, we welcome you, we welcome you, we welcome you, and we pray today that this broadcast will be a blessing to you. We are going to continue in our series, The Urgency of Now. Amen, the urgency of now. But today our topic is going to be the gathering of the saints. The gathering of the saints, the urgency of now. We put those two together. It is very important more than ever that the saints gather together. Jesus said, well, two of you shall agree as touching anything. It should be done by my Father, which is heaven. Where there are two or three um, gathered together in my name, there are I in the midst. And um, that's what we're going to talk about, how important it is for the saints to gather. But before we do, let's pray and ask for God's direction. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today, O oh Lord, asking you to open up our understanding so we may behold great things from your word. And Lord God, I ask you, God, to open to me, Lord God, a mouth of utterance, O oh God, so that I can utter and articulate your word the way that you would have me to. So Father, I ask you, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, first thing I want to start off with is this. Uh, we're dealing with the times because I, I always deal with the times. I'm sorry, but that's not sorry, but that's just part of what God gave me. I always deal with what's happening right now. I'm dealing with the times. So, as we look at the times that we are living in, the enemy has launched a very subtle attack on the church. And it's an attack that I find out that many seasons, season ministers are falling for. Um, this was something God sent out a warning about um, either at the beginning of the pandemic or right before the pandemic started. And what that warning was, and um, said it many times, I said, saints of God, I want you to remember that FB, Facebook, is not necessarily your friend. Is the, and, I, and I stick by that. Like my friend said, I said it, I meant it, I'm here to represent it. Yes, I stick by that. Although there are many good virtues to Facebook, like I'm on it right now, giving a word, right? But we have to be careful that we don't let the things that God has given us begin to, move, to use us and move us. Let's go to the book of, I believe it's 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And I just turned right to it, thank the Lord. Let's see, is that, no, it's 2 Peter chapter 1, and I turned to 1 Peter, but let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And it says this, 2 Peter chapter 1, according as his divine power has given unto us all things. How many things? All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now we're going to park it right there for a minute. First thing, I want to go back up to verse number three, and I want to pull something out. According as his divine power hath he's given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness. Excuse me. Now, what is this saying? God has given us all things. Remember, God gave us dominion. Christ has dominion. And if we're in Christ, we have dominion too over all things. What are we fighting for? What are we fighting for? What are we fighting against? We're fighting against principalities and powers of rulers of darkness of this world, against wickedness and high places. Okay? What does the Bible tell us? It tells us that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air, of the powers of the air. Now, let's bring all those things together and think. God has given us all things, not some, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Any technology that becomes available, if we are wise and we are smart, we can use that to the glory of God. Let's talk Facebook, okay? Facebook is a, it's a nice tool, okay? 
We can get on Facebook. We can preach the gospel. We can get on Facebook like I am right now. I can teach Sunday school, but what the enemy has done and how we have been, as Malcolm X said, we've been hoodwinked, we've been bamboozled. What happened was we are taking that technology and we are lifting up that technology above God. And some has even gone as far as saying, if you don't keep up with technology, your church is going to be the thing of the past. The devil is a liar. Jesus did not have Facebook in his day, neither did the Apostle Paul. They did not have Facebook. And the church did not die. They did not use technology, and the face and the church did not die. But Sister Scott, we're in another era right now. Saints, let me tell you this. The only era that we should be in right now is being transformed by the renewing of our mind in the kingdom of God, brought out of darkness into its marvelous light. That's the era we should be in right now. And so what has happened is even some of our most famous preachers are preaching, unless you keep up with technology, your church is a thing of the past. But saints, I want you to think about this now. And uh, I heard uh, uh, someone that I know mention this, and this was when it hit me like a ton of bricks. We have more virtual churches that's popping up. And I heard a, a, a young lady that I know mention that she has a, well, really a couple of them, that they have virtual churches. And she said, the reason for this virtual church, if you're just tired of church as usual, if you're just tired of the mess that's in church, you could be on a virtual church. And when she said it, it kind of hit me. I was like, oh, wait a minute now, something ain't right about that. If you're tired of these people in these churches, you can be a part of the virtual church. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm like, back the truck up. Number one, these people that's in these churches, we need them. You need them. Why? Let's go to Proverbs 27. Because this is all a part of God's plan, and the enemy is trying to stop the saints from gathering together because where there is unity, there is strength. Where there is unity, there is power. And so what, what should we do? What did God do during the time of uh, the uh, Babel. I'm going to go down and confuse their language. The devil has taken that, strain, that same strategy. I'm going to confuse them and have them fighting against one another. You're going to have the virtual church against the people that's in church. The people that's in church, we don't have time for you because y'all put up too much foolishness so I'll just go to the virtual church. Let me ask you a question. Virtual church members, who going to preach your funeral if you happen to leave this earth? Let me ask you that. Who going to go to the hospital and pray for your sick loved ones? It's not going to be that virtual preacher that lives in Timbuktu. It's not going to be him. Okay? Who's going to preach the, uh, who's going to be there to counsel you? Do you have those virtual preachers direct line? Do you have their personal phone numbers to counsel you when your kids are in trouble, to counsel you when you're in trouble? Hello? So what the enemy is doing is he's telling you you don't need the local church so he can draw you out set you apart, and eat you alive. And that's exactly what I said. Okay, so we're going to Proverbs chapter 27. Now, I didn't make it there yet. I'm about to make it there. I put my glasses on. Like I tell my class in school, uh, children, whenever you see Miss Scott, you know, not paying close, say, Scott, put your glasses on. And they are kindergartners. They're telling me, Scott, put your glasses on. Yep, Scott got her glasses on. Here we go. Let's go to Proverbs 27. Was it 27? Verse number 17. And then go, I'm going to go to both Bibles, Jewish study Bible and, Bible and also King James. Let's see how it's worded. Proverbs 27, verse number 17. Thank you. Um, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the counsel or countenance of his friend. Now, I want somebody to tell you that you don't need these people in church. Let me tell you something. In church, we love one another. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. Do that mean we're going to agree on everything? No. Do that mean you're going to like everything I say? No. Does that mean I'm going to like everything you say? No. Now, when we don't agree on, ev on everything, what do we do? Do we separate ourselves and say, well, forget you? No. We say, like Isaiah said, come now, let us reason together. That's what we do. And we get a common under, and we get understanding. When in the early days of the church, and always go back to the early days of the church. When in the early days of a ch of the church, there was this uh, dispute in the book of Acts um, about the um, 
the, 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 the Greek women wasn't getting served during the administration or passing out food or whatever, and there was one part of the congregation felt as though they was being neglected. Did they leave the church? No. They figured out an answer to the problem. And that's where the seven deacons came in. Okay? So because they had issues, they did not leave the church. They found the answer. When the Gentiles came into the church, hello, and there was a, a council at Jerusalem because the, the, the question was, how do we tell these Gentiles that they're going to be saved? Should we tell these Gentiles they need to keep the law of Moses? Should we tell these Gentiles they need to be circumcised? What did the church do? Did it split? No, it didn't split. Did some of them go and say, well, you know what? I'm a Gentile. I'm saved. I don't want to have nothing to do with y'all Jews. No, they didn't do that. What did they do? They had a meeting. And they got counsel from the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost told them what to do. Now, our problem may just be is we don't want God's direction. But if we want God's direction, he will give us his direction. We will stand strong. The church will be strong. Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. So why are my well-meaning sisters and brothers trying to separate the church and tell people, well, you don't have to put up with that foolishness. Yes, you do have to put up with the foolishness if you want to be saved. How long did Jesus put up with our foolishness? And he's still putting up with some of our foolishness. But did he walk off and leave? No, he did not. I'm going to start a cyber church. Cyber pastors, how many of those people in your cyber church do you know name by name? Unless they give an exorbitant amount of money. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, but it's out there. How many of those members you have in cyberspace, are you there to help them, to counsel them, to talk to their children? How many of your cyberspace members, if they pass away, you're going to show up at their funerals? Think about it. Do not leave the church. That's the body of Christ. And if you separate yourself from the body, it's not the church that's going to be lost. It's going to be you. Hello. Let's move on. We're going to um, Hebrews chapter 10. Hmm. And this is uh, what it says in the Complete Jewish Study Bible, uh, Proverbs 27, 17. Just as iron sharpens iron, a person sharpens the character of his friend. If you really my friend, you're going to tell me the truth and not agree with me all the time because sometimes I'm off. And I'm not going to walk away from the church. So the premise that the reason why we have this cyber church, the reason why we have this online church is because this is a safe haven for you to get away from the saints. That's a fallacy. You shouldn't be trying to get away from the saints. That's a fallacy. Now let's go to Hebrews, chapter number, uh, ooh, what is that? Chapter number 10. And I'm going to go complete Jewish study Bible and also my own. Uh, well, that is complete Jewish study, study Bible and King James. And we are talking about the gathering of the saints, why it is so important. Okay. 10 and I believe it's 25. Let's go back up to verse number 22. From King James, it reads, and then I'm going to read it from a complete Jewish study Bible if it's necessary. King James reads, verse number 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, don't Think evil of your brother and your sister, telling people to get away from the saints because it's too much fun. That's no, that's not right. So we need to have our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us consider, where am I? Verse number 24? No, number three, 23, I'm sorry. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised us. Hold fast the profession of your faith. Did you get saved in church? 
what it took for you to get saved is going gonna, is gonna to take for you to stay saved. Yes. Well, Sister Scott, I didn't get saved in church. I got saved in my car. I got saved in my room. Well, cool. That's good. But the bottom line is the church is the body of Christ. Hello. Well, Sister Scott, that ain't talking about a building. Let's talk about that one, okay? So you say, Sister Scott, that's not talking about, no, it's not talking about a building. You're absolutely right. However, the, ch the early church, and let me give you some history. They went from house to house breaking bread, which meant they came together. It was not until around the year 324 AD that Emperor Constantine decided, I don't know whether he was a real Christian or not, but he decided, you know what? We need to keep an eye on these church faith folks so what we can do is let them have their own their own temple like Zeus does let them have their own temple like Diana does let them have their own temple like all these other gods that's being served in the Roman Empire that way we can keep an eye on them they'll be happy there's gonna be peace in the valley okay now that was when the original like church building came into and I believe the first church was the first of the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre which is built right over the tomb of Christ in Jerusalem got it got it good okay so in the early church going back there they broke bread they went from house to house okay in the early church they also met in the synagogue that's why they had so much trouble in the synagogue because the church was talking and meeting in there too but they, uh, we're going to go back to going to house to house. Now, once the church went through a lot of persecution from that time on because they was coming in the houses, Paul, Saul was guilty of it, coming in people's houses, taking them, um, uh, 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 putting them in jail, persecuting them. And for a long time from, what is that, about uh, the resurrection of Christ up until Constantine, which was about 324 A.D., the church had gone through persecution, persecution, persecution. It was a welcome thing when Constantine said, we're going to make Christianity legal, and we're going to let you guys have a place to worship. That was a welcome thing. It was a good thing. But along with that came this. Along with Constantine saying that other people had their other temples and whatnot that they were worshiping in, but along with Constantine saying that, Constantine added a few little things in there. And one of the things that was added in there, and I'm not going to harbor, and one day I'm going to get to this, but I don't think you're ready for it now, was you're going to worship on the day of the sun. Think about it. Okay? The day of worship will be the day of the sun. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm not going there. I'm going to stick to where I am because we can only digest so much at one time. So anyway, there was a trade-off, okay? Now, they, the church actually grew and prospered. But one thing about it, it was like after we got the building thing, it was like the, the uh, not magnitude, but the momentum of what happened on Pentecost in those days after where you had three and four and 5,000 people getting saved at one time, as we look in history, that momentum began to wane. But people were still getting saved now. Okay? Now, we're in an era of mega churches, 5,000 members. How many people got saved last year? None. Think about it. Okay? But this is still not an excuse to not gather together because what we have to do is clean our hearts god's been calling for repentance do it let's get this thing right it's time to move on so moving on what the enemy did because people in back in the 80s church became very popular Everybody got saved. Michael Jackson got saved. Everybody was getting saved. Everybody was speaking, was um, preaching gospel. Man in the Mirror was played on gospel stations just like it was played on any other station. Black and white on gospel stations just like it was on any other station. Stairway to heaven. That's aging me, but I know that song, okay? That was being played on gospel stations just like every other station, okay? 
So everything and everybody flocking in, supposedly getting saved, which is the same thing that happened around the 6th century A.D. And another thing that happened around the 6th century A.D. was something else that began to happen in the 90s. In the 90s, early 2000s, what became very popular was drama in the church. Y'all remember that? Drama. Come to church on, and not so much drama on Easter and Christmas, but on Sunday mornings. Well, Sister Scott, did you say something was wrong with that? This is what I'm saying. God has given us all things that we can use, but we can't let those things start using us. Got what I'm saying? We can't let those things use us. So drama became very popular in the church. I know I used to write it, okay, until I got a revelation that you got to stop that. And I, and I was thank the Lord when I was able to stop it because I'm just not into that right now. But drama is going to draw people. The gospel is going to draw people, okay? And please, God, that men should be saved through what? Through the foolishness of preaching, all right? Everybody doing drama in the ninth in round the nineties, early two thousands. But check this out. This is what happened in the sixth century A.D. People started doing drama. That waned off. Okay, this is this has waned off. And so now we go from drama to Facebook. Okay, and so now. Facebook is this wonderful opportunity. As I said, it's good to use, but don't let it use you. We have this wonderful opportunity. You no longer have to pay the radio station to put on your broadcast. Woohoo! You no longer have to pay the television station to put on your broadcast. Whoopee! It's cool. But something happened with that, wherein instead of using Facebook, now Facebook has started using the church. Because this is what's happening now. You know, you can have a, 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 a service on preaching real good, and all of a sudden a commercial kick in. Have any of you seen that yet? All of a sudden a commercial kicks in. Now, you can be preaching about holiness, and the commercial can be about the movie Anarchy. What does that do? Breaks the concentration. The enemy knows that. It breaks the concentration. And, I, and then also, let me tell you another thing. You could be preaching the word, and all of a sudden, the sound goes out. The screen blanks out. And so the most important part of that word, who you think listening didn't hear it. Think about it. Are you saying Facebook? No, 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 no. I'm not saying Facebook is evil. But what I'm saying is don't let what God allows us to use begin to use us. Because this is where it's going now. I got my cyber church. I got my Facebook church. If you're fed up with the people in the church, you can just join my cyber church. Let's keep reading Hebrews. And it says, verse number 24, And let us consider one another provoking unto love and good works. What does that word provoke mean? To provoke somebody don't necessarily mean that they're going to be like, ooh, yes, whatever. To provoke somebody means sometimes it's going to be kind of tough. You're going to be like, mm, you got to be right there. I'm going to provoke you to good works. I'm going to make you so, I'm going to make you so mad at the devil, you're going to start fighting back. I'm going to make you so mad at the devil working in me, you're going to start fighting him back. I'm going to provoke you. Uh, the, the Gentiles provoke. The salvation of the Gentiles was meant to provoke the Jews. They saw what the Gentiles were doing, they got jealous. So to provoke can also mean a godly, give them a godly jealousy. How can somebody be godly jealous of you and want to do better if they don't never see you? Crickets? Yeah. How can someone be godly jealous of your good works and they never see it? Frogs? No, don't hear them either. Think, I mean, seriously, think about it. So it says, let us consider one another, iron sharpening iron, to provoke, that's that sharpening, unto love and to good works. And let's continue. 
Verse number 25. How do we provoke not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is? Let's park it there. How can we provoke? Remember I said you can't provoke somebody if you don't see them and if they don't see you. Somebody got to see somebody to provoke them. How do we do that? By not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, you in your house, you in your house, you up north, you in Florida, and we got a Sabbath preacher in the middle. No. The assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is because people were doing it, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let that sink in. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because in that we encourage each other, we provoke each other to good works. In that we can testify to one another, we can build each other, we can strengthen each other in good things. We can tell somebody that face to face, hold on, face to face, what you've been through, I've been through, let's make it through together, face to face, let's pray. And let me hear one other thing before I get off of this. It, but exhorting one another as you, and so much more as you see the day approaching. No, I'm going to leave that one alone. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to leave that one alone. And let's see. Uh, and we're going to stop right there. As you see the day approaching. Now, let's go to the book of, I'm still going to deal a little bit with iron chopping iron while we need each other. Let's go to the book of, let's see. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's see how, that, how this reads. Um, get out, get out, up. 10, 25. Okay. That was... Oh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 12. Okay, so let's go up to verse number 10. Okay, it says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Verse number 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doeth his children. And verse number 12. That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called us unto his kingdom and glory. So, Sister Scott, what has this got to do with um, not forsaking yourselves together? I think I'm glad you asked, and I'm going to tell you what it has to do with it. Another reason why we gather together is for purposes of accountability. For purposes of accountability. Iron sharpeneth iron. Paul said here, he said, you are witnesses of how holy, in other words, you see me. If you see hypocrisy in me, call it out like Paul did for Peter. Okay, that's going to, and, 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 and if I mean good, I'm not going to say, well, you ain't got no business judging me. No, 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 no. If you see hypocrisy in my life, because sometimes others can see things in you you can't see in yourself. So this is for accountability. If you see a hypocrisy in my life, call it out. We like to say, Lord, if you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out and strengthen me. I want to be right, I want to be saved, I want to be whole, but we don't want nobody to tell us. So what if God uses somebody in the congregation to tell me, you ain't, you ain't behaving right, you ain't behaving saved, and you ain't behaving whole? Now, if I got my little virtual church on the side, I can say, I'm tired of these people judging me. I can join a virtual church, but it ain't going to help me. Because as long as I run, I'm not going to straighten up. But if I examine myself, like the apostle said, if I examine myself, I can be saved. 
I can repent. I can get it right if I examine myself. This is why it is so important for the saints to gather together. And it's not finding fault, but if I have a fault and it's out there, and I'm like the emperor with no clothes and don't realize that it's out there, somebody need to tell me something so I can cover up. Do you all remember that children's story? The emperor has no clothes. Y'all remember that one? A uh, little story about, um, and it was really kind of cute, but it carries a great message because I see a lot of that today. This emperor thought he had it going on, okay? He wanted the best. He wanted the most glorious. He wanted the greatest. He wanted the most immaculate. He wanted the most beautiful. And people would tell you, you're a child of God. You should have the best. You should have the greatest. You should have the most beautiful. You should drive the best car. You should have the biggest house because you're a child of the king. Don't fool yourself. And so the emperor decided, time for me to get a new role, something else that's wonderful, that's awesome, that's great, that's the best, something that nobody else has. And so there was somebody in the kingdom that came from without the kingdom who saw the emperor's vanity. And brothers and sisters, I'll be honest with you, the enemy can see our vanity. He can see how that saw the emperor's vanity. Oh, let's call that lust of the flesh. That's your vanity, okay? And they came up with a plan and said, this man's so stuck on himself, let's stick it to him. And they did. So they went to the emperor, and they was like, well, Mr. Emperor, we're going to make a robe that's only good enough for you. We're going to make a robe for you that is so wonderful that common people won't even be able to touch it. Common people won't understand. Common people won't even be able to see it. So if anybody can't see it, it's because this thing is so far, and I'm paraphrasing, it's so far above their pay grade. It's so far above their level. It's so beyond them because, Emperor, you are so beyond everybody else. And Emperor was like, ooh, yes, let's do it, okay? They go down in the hole, and I'm going to call it the hole, and they're making all this noise, chang, 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 zuga, zuga, zuga. And the emperor's like, ooh, they must be really working hard, man. The emperor, whew, we just need a little bit more time. Zing, 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 zing. Buka, buka, buka. Okay? Hmm. And then they come out, holding nothing in their hands. All right? The emperor looks, and they say, Mr. Emperor, how do you like this? Isn't this wonderful? Because only the most intelligent, only the best people in the kingdom can see it. Only the people whose, and I'm paraphrasing, only the people whose IQ are so far above everybody else's can even see it. The common people can't even see it because it's not worthy of them. And the emperor, no, he didn't see nothing, went, oh, yes, I can see it. Oh, yes, I can see it. All right, so Emperor, take your clothes off and let's put on this robe. And we're going to march you outside. They march him outside naked. And they were still telling him how wonderful, how glorious he was. And he was naked as a jaybird. And the people in the crowd was like, what's wrong with him? Something, Emperor done lost his mind? And see, saints, that's what happened with us. If we don't have somebody to keep us in check, you can straight up lose your mind and not even know it. And finally, one child out of the mouth of babes had the audacity, had the nerve, had the boldness, had the courage to say, but he's naked. And when the child said, he's naked, they kind of broke the ice and the emperor knew he was naked and he went away embarrassed. Now, this is the way it is in the church. This is, no, okay, this is the way it is in society, I'll put it that way. When you are, when the enemy draws you out because he's playing on your vanity and telling you nobody in the church could tell you nothing, and if they had a fall and try to correct you, that makes them a hypocrite, he's drawing you out. Because somebody else may not be perfect, if they, and is not, and they correct you, on something you did, you don't have no business judging me. That's your vanity. That's your pride. Well, I'm a bishop. You're just a lay member. You shouldn't tell. That's your pride. Buddy, you're naked. Put some clothes on. Let somebody cover you. Okay? So, 
The moral of this story is, God gives us all things to use. The emperor had seamstresses and tailors in his kingdom that he could have used that would have given him what he needed to cover himself. But because of his vanity, because he fed his vanity, he was deceived. We will be deceived if we feed our vanity. And our vanity will tell us nobody in the church is right but you. So you need to separate yourself and get away. That's your vanity. Our vanity will tell us, I'm going to start my own church. What? And it's going to be an online church. What? That's your vanity. Well, God told me to start this church. You better make sure. Because if you do, remember, as a pastor, you are watching for their souls. You're not just there to ask for a donation. You're there to watch for their souls. Whose soul can you watch for and you don't know who they are? Did I go too far? I ain't went far enough. Whose soul can you watch for if you don't even know them? If all you saw was a picture of them on the screen? Whose spirit can you discern if they're looking at you on video? How can you be the pa oh Jesus? How can you be a pastor to watch for the souls of people who may just turn you on at eleven o'clock and leave the computer at eleven o five, but it's still running? How are you watching for their souls? Hmm. Okay. This is just food for thought. If you feel that God told you to do it, I'm not here to tell you that he didn't, but I just put out some food for thought for you to think about. If you believe that God called you to be a part of a cyber church, I want you to think about a few things. Who going to bury you? Who going to preach your funeral? Who going to pray for your kids? Do you have a direct line in case of emergency? Who's going to watch for your soul? Who's going to warn you of things to come? Who's going to tell you when to fast? Who's going to hold you accountable for anything? That's just if you think you're called to be part of a cyber church. I would admonish you. God has assemblies. God has people in this city. In every city, God's got somebody. Connect yourself with a b -b body of believers. Connect with a body of believers. Oh, Sister Scott, what about COVID? Do you go out to dinner? Do your kids go to school? Do you pay your bills? Are you in a rubber room? Are you in, living in a bubble? Go to church. Well, Sister Scott, maybe I'll accept that if you say that in love. Let me try it this way. Go to church. Jesus loves you. He wants you to be connected to a body of believers because iron sharpens iron. Amen? Amen. Was that better? I hope so. Saints, Listen, saints, ain'ts, and everything in between. Jesus do love you. We love you too. And the only reason why I put this message out the way that I've laid it out was because you need to think. It is time for us to get as close to God as possible. Not just get close to him, but be in him and he be in us. This is no time for playing. If you have been told that the wave of the future is the cyber church, you're going to miss it. Why? Number one, Jesus told his disciples, <clears throat> and this is a paraphrase, the way you see the world operates, you're not supposed to operate that way. 
How should we operate by being led by the Spirit of God? If God told you the church is going to die if it's not on Facebook, YouTube, or whatever, if it's not in social media, the church is going to die. Now, if God told you that, have at it. But I promise you, I don't think he told nobody else that. Because God's church is not dependent upon technology. God's church is not dependent upon technology. So, I'm not going to fight you if you say God told you to do it, because that's not my job. But I do want to tell you, you better make sure. What I can hold on to is the word of God that says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. What I can hold on to is that the saints of God, we come together for encouragement, we come together for exaltation, we come together to, to commune together. That's what I know. What I do know is this. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent and the violent take it by force. What I do know is this. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my appointed time, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What I do know is this. They that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And what I will tell you is this. I can guarantee you more people got COVID in Walmart than they did in church. Stop being scared. Come to church. Join yourself with believers. Because when you hear their testimonies, you're going to realize that you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony can save somebody's life not going to Walmart, not staying out of church, but your testimony can save somebody's life. Amen? That's all I have for today. I pray that this has been a blessing to you, and I'm going to be honest with you. This entire Sunday school lesson was off the cuff. Coming to church this morning, I had no idea what I was going to talk about. Coming up to this pulpit, I got four scriptures, and I wrote them down totally off the cuff. Now, I pray it's been a blessing to you. I pray that you listen, and I pray that you find a house of worship, and I pray that you start looking now. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you in church. But if you can't come, I hope to, I hope you join in with us again on next Sunday. Same time, same place. God bless you.